Thank you to these companies and organizations that make the Before I Die New Mexico Festival possible. A good goodbye, Gail Rubin, puts the fun in funeral planning. Compassion and choices, improving care, expanding options, and empowering everyone to chart their end of life journey. Daniel's Family Funerals and Cremations, Fairview Memorial Park, Gabaldon Mortuary, Sandia Memory Gardens, and Vista Verde Memorial Park, all in the Albuquerque area. Estate Pros, offering professional dispersal of personal possessions due to a move, illness, or death. The Final Exit Network, educating about and defending the right to choose at end of life. French Funerals and Cremations and Sunset Memorial Park in Albuquerque. Gathering Us, providing in-person and virtual memorial services and online memorial pages. Keeper, providing hybrid and virtual memorial services and keeping memories alive with online tributes to preserve, celebrate, and share life legacies. Morris Hall, estate planning attorneys in New Mexico and Arizona. Remembering a Life, your guide to honoring a life well-lived from planning a tribute to mourning a loved one. And Retirement Extender, investment management services with a personalized strategy recommendation based on your needs and objectives. Uh, welcome to Sunday morning in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We just had a great Death Cafe conversation and our first virtual program with the folks in the room and you folks out there on Zoom is with Karen Hyatt. She is the uh, founder and manager of Estate Pros LLC, which is based in Santa Fe, New Mexico. They have helped families and individuals to downsize, organize, and distribute the contents of estates since 2011. And she knows her stuff. So please give a big round of applause to Karen Hyatt. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for those in the room. Can you hear me in the back? Good. And thank you for all of those who are in your home, on your patio, on the beach, on the East Coast, in the flooding, wherever you are, we welcome you today. Um, this presentation really is not a pitch for our services, but I'm going to tell you um, initially what motivated me to start this service. Um, I recognized, I live in Santa Fe, and I recognized that when people died, often their adult children, relatives did not have the time or money or knowledge to come handle all the belongings in their uh, loved one's home after they died. So I saw this opportunity to serve families who are in the middle of grief to be able to assist them or actually handle everything for them if they could not come to the home themselves. Uh, so that's really the essence and motivation of our service. It's kind of like uh, chop wood, carry water. It's a very basic, concrete service that we offer the community. And we do work Las Lunas, which is just south of Albuquerque, all the way to the Colorado border. Um, today, we're going to specifically talk about downsizing um, and property distribution. But for those of you who are joining us today, um, this is an opportunity to trigger some good ideas about how to go ahead now before we get really ill or die and leave all of that stuff to our families. And as you can see this image, one of our clients, we moved a couple to Colorado to a, a senior facility there and they had traveled a lot in Southeast Asia. And she had taken this picture and she gave it to me to use in some of our presentations. I think this encapsulates what a lot of our homes, garages, barns, storage units, cellars look like. It's just that they're not on wheels when we handle it. 
Also, I want to mention the handout I gave you does not exactly follow this presentation, but that um, handout is actually meant to be a worksheet. So if something I say or one of you mentions triggers an idea for you or an action you want to take, use that as a worksheet and just write all over it to help you move forward. Um, communication is key in this whole process. Uh, I suggest strongly that all of us, myself included, um, start to gift items to family and friends and nonprofits and organizations now. And you say, but gee, if I give it now, then I'm no longer getting to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And that's true, you may not be wearing your necklace anymore or have the art on the wall, but you have the extra gift of getting to see your family or friend wear it or enjoy it rather than you. So it's really um, a good opportunity to go ahead and say to a good friend, I'd really like you to have this. That's fine. <laughs> may I? Yeah, hold on. No. There we go. Okay. <laughs> uh, Gail, just for those of you who are in the virtual word is, world, is trying to kind of... I'm messing take, with the screen. Sorry. Take some things away. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's fine. Um, so in property distribution, but this, this would be after someone dies, but you could go ahead and use this checklist now. It's really a good idea to go ahead and start creating your own inventory of items in your home that are really special to you. And these may not be your most valuable items. Um, in my home, I do have some uh, valuable furniture that was handmade uh, about 30 years ago by a woodworker in northern New Mexico, but that's really not what's the most special to me. What's most special to me are some shells that my son and I collected along the beaches of California in all the years we went there to vacation. And those are very special to him also. Also, my library is really special to me, but about 10 years ago, I said to my son, who's now 34, and an attorney in San Francisco, I said, uh, you know what, I'm gonna start to call my library, and also I do a lot of writing. I said, I'm gonna start to shred a lot of my writings. He said, no, 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 no. He said, if you do, we will have a serious discussion about it after you're gone. He said, do not get rid of any of your library or any of your writings. So I'm dutifully storing boxes of books and papers of drafts and uh, essays that I've written for him in the future. He may totally enjoy that library and those drafts, and he may shred it someday when I'm gone. And he says, why did I ask mom to keep all that stuff? And honestly, I'm also gifting some of my books to other people, and he'll never know they're gone. So, you know, you just can't keep all of it, right? Um, some of you will have very valuable art furniture, maybe some clothing, uh, and jewelry, and artifacts, maybe pottery, baskets, if you live in this area. Um, go ahead, please, now, and get an updated appraisal on those things. I know 2008, do you still need to? We need to share your screen with the Zoom people. I asked Gail to come back to this image for those in the virtual world, because I'm assuming they weren't seeing anything this whole time, right? Right. Okay, Likewise. just for a little laugh, just wanted all of those who are joining us elsewhere to see this, I'm guessing, family who definitely needed to downsize. Um, and most of us are in that same boat. I have to tell you, in almost 11 years now of owning this business and serving hundreds of families in Northern New Mexico, there have only been a handful that I would say didn't need any more downsizing. In other words, they kind of live like Zen monks and they'd have a cup in the cabinet, you know, and a toothbrush and toothpaste. Well, that's not how most of us live, myself included. So um, let's just zip onto this. Just a few things uh, still that I wanna mention. So um, I suggest if you can afford even just a few hours of an appraiser's time 
that if you have some uh, extremely valuable items in your home that you get an updated and current appraisal by a certified appraiser. No one in my company is a certified appraiser, especially if you had previously had appraisals done, if they were done before 2008, have an updated one because you may remember that's when the economy tanked. And uh, especially in the Southwest, although our art sales are very brisk in the last few years, prices are very different and values are very different than they were before 2008. So I'm just gonna skip on, cause we're gonna come back to this list as we go through. Um, an inventory might be as basic as this inventory that you just see without pictures to the left. Do you need to, sure. Change this setting here. Um, and that is actually an inventory that we did for a client that we moved from Santa Fe to Virginia so that um, the inventory number corresponded to the boxes that we were packing for her so that there was no writing on the box about what the contents were. We never like to put contents on a box if someone else is going to be moving the boxes. Um, anyway, it's just a security issue. And so you might wanna start an inventory. You might want an inventory that looks more like the one that's near the center of the page that has a numbered item as well as the number in the left-hand column, then a description, then a value. And then sometimes it's where is that piece to end up? Um, any of you could create an inventory like this. You do not need to hire a professional, although we'd be happy to do that for you if you needed it. Uh, Gail, I think. Sorry. <laughs> oh, there, it just yeah. went, I got it. Um, this is coming back to gifting items now to family and friends um, before you be maybe lose your cognitive ability to do that. Um, but even if you don't actually gift the item now, if you can go ahead and make a list, uh, very much describing what the uh, item is, maybe take a picture of it and then who you want to receive that item, you can either have it in one document or a lot of people, and I'm sure some of you have done this, you can also put a note on the item like this clock that's in the middle. You could maybe on the back uh, just say who you want to receive that in the family or a friend uh, once you're gone. Um, many, many things, and let me just say to those of you who are joining us in the virtual world, Lord knows you may be in Canada, Alabama, uh, Washington State, um, but you're going to recognize that a lot of our images are definitely Southwest specific, the turquoise jewelry, pottery, things like that. Um, again, I wanna suggest that any valuable jewelry be appraised beforehand and be very clear about who's going to get it. I often tell the story that we were working several years ago in a home of a gentleman who died. He had four adult sons who lived from New Hampshire to New Zealand. Uh, everything was going to them in one, uh, man, in a, one manner or the other. But he had a note ad uh, addendum to his will that said, give my favorite Rolex watch to my favorite nephew. Well, the man had like six Rolex watches. And of course, people like us coming in, neutral people who didn't know anyone in the family, had not a clue what his favorite Rolex watch was, nor his favorite nephew. Now, as we talked to the four sons, we eventually deduced who that what what watch should go to which nephew. But um, be more specific than that, please. Um, also currency, we find a lot of people have been saving uh, international foreign money for a long time. They've, uh, we've been saving coins. Um, sometimes these coin collections can be quite valuable. Again, that's something you might wanna have appraised um, sooner than later to really learn what the value is. Um, sadly, what we find is that a lot of these special collectible coins that people have been saving really have almost no value or they strictly have face value. 
So sometimes family members are a little disappointed about that. Silver is um, a collectible, and I know all of you have now heard this story. The generations coming after us, though our children, our grandchildren, they really don't care about three things. They don't care about China, they don't care about silver, and they don't care about crystal. Now, that is not an accusation about those generations, but the problem is those of us who are now trying to sell off crystal, silver, and china just are not going to get the same value for it that we might have gotten 20, 30 years ago. Um, I always try to encourage uh, all of us to remember how much we've enjoyed those items through the years in our own homes. Uh, holiday dinners, uh, special dinners with friends. And then um, if no one in your family wants those things when you're gone, uh, you could go ahead and gift them to, um, we really suggest gifting them to a nonprofit who maybe works with families in transition, who, in other words, men or women who are homeless, but are now living in transitional housing applying for jobs, they now need a new apartment, they need the apartment furnished. So for someone to get your pottery or china who has nothing but the backpack on their back, that would be an, a pretty amazing gift. Um, now there is some china and silver that is very valuable. Uh, it tends to be older, it tends to be from Europe, uh, very high-end china. Silver, uh, we find, and I'm talking about sterling silver, a lot of people, this just makes me cringe when I say these words, but a lot of people are just literally selling it to be melted down for that day's market value. Um, and you know, if it's a fork, a knife, and a spoon, you may not care so much, um, but there, there is still a market for resale sterling silver if they are very unique uh, serving pieces, tea service, coffee service. Um, some people still just love uh, having those in their homes. So it's not all wasted. Um, one of the things that we really encourage you to do is if you've been the family historian, uh, and some of you here may be the family historian, um, find the historian in the next generation and make sure you have a commitment from that person to receive all of the notebooks, the jottings, the stories that you've written, the pictures, the scrapbooks, so that your family history lives on in an appointed uh, historian. I often point out in this small picture to the left, those little children's shoes, actually came from a home in uh, North Santa Fe, and um, they were the shoes of a child who died in the Holocaust. Um, and this was part of the memorabilia that this family uh, from France had kept. Um, often we find like the older photo in the middle we often find these photographs in trunks or boxes that have not been stored well. Uh, so when you're packing things that are vulnerable to moisture and heat, um, we suggest that you wrap them not only in a cardboard box, and we suggest a double walled car cardboard box. You can get those at Lowe's or Home Depot, and I do not own stock in either of those companies. Um, but line the box with plastic, like a black plastic trash bag, and then start to put your photos in there or even put them in plastic slip covers so that you're um, hoping to preserve the paper materials uh, for generations to come. Now, also in memorabilia, we're pretty much moving out of this era, but heretofore, we were always finding medals and awards from people who had served in World War II and the Korean War. We're pretty much beyond that now. Most of those vets have now died. Um, and in fact, many uh, people who served in Vietnam uh, are quickly dying. 
Um, but these kind of awards, if no one, well, awards from the service, if no one in your family wants to keep those, we encourage you to take them to your local muse, uh, military museum or organization who welcomes those kinds of things being returned. So we often return medals um, and flags that were used on uh, caskets at the funeral. The valuables that you have uh, in this middle set of images, um, the tractor that is there, we facilitated an auction in uh, south of Albuquerque. And this John Deere tractor was the drawing card. Mainly men came from Texas, Arizona, Colorado, and all over New Mexico because that tractor had been advertised. But of course the auctioneer wisely auctioned off everything else during the day and held that to the last minute. But those kind of things have a huge draw. And some of you who come from fa uh, farming and ranching families uh, will know that you've got those kinds of equipment in your family or in some barn. Um, the image in the middle is a hand-drawn, hand-tinted map. We found about 20 of them rolled up in a retired school teacher. She wasn't only a school teacher. She was a PhD professor at the University of Texas who lived in uh, New Mexico. But we found these rolled up in her guest bedroom closet, um, recognized that they had possibly some value, brought in an appraiser of maps, and they did end up appraising for just under $25,000, which when sold added to the cash distribution of that woman's, for that woman's beneficiaries. So don't just toss these things. And I will make a sexist comment here. We find that men are much less patient with going through things in a home and go, oh, get rid of it, get rid of it, get rid of it. We just hear that all the time. So I often will turn to the females in the family and say, but how do you want us to handle it? It's not that I'm ignoring the men, it's just men just don't have the patience, it seems. I know that's sexist. Sorry, that's just the way it is. Um, also, this beautiful to the left antique cabinet, China Hutch, um, was built in Germany uh, over 100 years ago. And sadly, in our greater southwestern market, a piece of furniture like that does not hold as much value as, for instance, uh, something that was built in New Mexico or a Mexican piece of furniture. Uh, you can sell it. It's just not going to sell for as much as if you were in Dallas or Atlanta, maybe the Northeast. And then books, I've always said I need a 12-step program for books. I love books and I still buy books. Um, but just because a book is old or a first edition or signed does not mean it's going to have value. Sadly, as you all know, we're in a time where books just do not hold their, their value um, the way they used to. Uh, people will still buy them on the secondary market, but not for great amounts of money. These kinds of furniture in our market will sell more quickly and for more money than the beautiful antique piece that was in the previous slide. I think that goes without saying. And then of course, uh, pottery. There is a good market as we know in the Southwest. Again, if you think eventually you want to sell it, if no one in your family wants your pottery or your basket or textile collections, start to sell them now rather than waiting uh, till you've died and someone in your family or a professional will need to sell them. Uh, that way it's not like a fire sale at the very end. And then the only thing I want to mention about art is, and these pictures aren't too great, and I took them myself, so I'm criticizing myself. But the image in the middle is an oil painting by John Axton, who is a New Mexico artist. And then this is a certificate of that piece on the back. Um, if you have art that you're wanting to sell, uh, take the, if you want to present it either to a gallery or an auction house, 
to sell it, they will want pictures of the front of the piece and the back. Um, a lot of times there won't be this certificate on the back, but a lot, as you all know, a lot of artists will sign their art on the back and date it and maybe even put the name of the piece um, on the back. And especially an auction house will want pictures of the front and back as an authenticating image for the piece. I just want to say to, to those in the room, if any of you have questions or additional instructions as we're going through, certainly just flag me and I'm happy to just make this as informal as possible uh, to respond to any questions you may have. Um, beneficiaries uh, sometimes cannot come to your home or a family member's home uh, when there's been a death and so often especially these days, you may need to take pictures of items to send to them, either as attachments to emails, as a thumb drive, um, using Dropbox. There's just any number of ways you can send images to family members. And these are just some of them. We encourage you, if you're sending your own uh, photos to go ahead and number the item. You see here we've used our pre-printed numbers on the hats and then down here on these miscellaneous items in the lower right hand corner. But um, that really saves issues about communication when beneficiaries start to respond to you like oh we'd like the cross that's in the lower right hand of that picture and so in this case, rather than just having one number on that whole group of things, uh, you might wanna put a number on the cross before you ever send it out uh, so that you're really getting uh, accurate feedback from the family members. And then in some families, especially dad's hats, uh, hold a lot of meaning for adult children and uh, people wanna save those. Um, you can go ahead and start to consign things now or donate them now. We find that uh, both consignment stores and donation uh, places, whether that's Savers or a, 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 a nonprofit that receives donations for their specific, let's say, animal shelter or homeless shelter for women, uh, before you just load up your car and start to take things, give them a call first. 30 minutes on the phone with the different nonprofits and consignment stores will save you a lot of gasoline and a lot of frustration because we're finding that both consignment stores and nonprofits are so busy these days because so many people not only are boomers, you know, downsizing a lot, and I'm a boomer. Uh, but also because of COVID, everybody's been home, you all know that, and people are cleaning out the attic, they're cleaning out their root cellar. I mean, uh, people are being very industrious, and so these places can't always take what you have, and especially um, homeless shelters, we find that those requests change weekly. Um, we, this just happened to us last week, we had tons of women's clothing to take from an estate to one of our uh, homeless shelters in Santa Fe. And we didn't even call first because we go there, you know, like three times a week. And they said, we can't take any clothing. And they would only take our cleaning products, meaning from this home, and women's hygiene uh, elements like uh, makeup, shampoo, conditioner, lotion, that kind of thing. Uh, so we had to find another donation place for the clothing. But the calls first will really save you time. Um, this I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on. I find that either people in our age group either know almost nothing about electronic saving of information and sharing of information, or we already have our preferred way of doing that. So I'll just share with you that my son and I, again, he lives in San Francisco. We just created a Dropbox file. And whenever my credit card passwords change or my bank passwords change or whatever it is, 
I just, you know, write it in there and it's available to him if something should happen to me um, in the meantime. But you can use any of these uh, ways to save your information. Um, property disposal, especially when it comes to handguns, medicines, and household hazardous waste, uh, let's all commit to being safe, uh, both for humans, animals, and the planet. And so by that I mean, as we all know just recently, a tragic um, accident happened uh, in northern New Mexico on a movie set with a firearm. People have firearms in our homes. Almost everyone who lives in the West has a firearm. So um, if you're wanting to sell it, go to a reputable dealer. Always make sure there are no, there's no ammunition in the gun. Um, people have also huge collections of firearms, usually men, not always. Um, about a year and a half ago, we inventoried 160 firearms and swords that this gentleman had collected through the years. And slowly, those are being sold through a retailer in New Mexico. And then just last week, I assessed a new home where the gentleman had died, and there are 80 long guns, um, some of them collectibles, in that home, and we'll be doing an inventory. But anyway, mainly be careful about firearms. And if, if it's in a home where a female friend of yours has died, do not be surprised when you find a gun and ammunition either in a kitchen drawer or in the bedroom. We find that most women who have a handgun, that's where they'll have them for, for personal safety and security. So just um, be aware of that as you're going through a friend or family member's home. Medicines, um, if you've just finished a prescription and maybe had a half dozen meds left in the bottle, make sure you dispose of those correctly so that they don't get in our water system uh, below ground. And really the easiest way to do that is just to take them to one of the local pharmacies. Usually they'll receive your drugs, whether it's pills, capsules, or liquids. Uh, but go ahead and do that on a regular basis um, so that they're not just sitting around. And then household hazardous waste, honestly, can be anything from a fabric softener to oil in the garage. Um, again, just maybe once or twice a year, run through the garage and go, I'm not using that anymore, you know, and take it to the landfill on the day that they receive household hazardous waste. In Santa Fe, they only receive it on Friday afternoon and Saturdays. Um, and in every community in New Mexico, it's a little different. Um, in terms of storing your items, sometimes some of you may be artists, and that was the situation here. We handled a studio of a woman who'd been a lifelong potter. She made both functional light fixtures and these beautiful Buddha statues. And of course, when she died, the family didn't want all of that just discarded in some way. And it we were in the middle of COVID, and so it was hard to sell those things immediately. So these items were moved from her studio into storage, and uh, tarps were placed over these things. And as we start to move out of COVID, um, we'll be taking care of those. Downsizing is a constant issue. Even for me, um, my goal right now is to go through my garage before the end of the year. I've just got to go through it one more time. And um, so to keep up with it, and people say to me, but I'm now 75 and I don't bend over as easily as I used to, or I can't pick up a 40 pound box as I used to. You don't have to hire a professional to help you. Um, surely there's a teenage kid on the street that wants to earn a little extra money 
and can help you move things in the garage, can climb up on ladders and take them down. They would love an excuse to get to drive your car or their family's car someplace to donate something. So it doesn't always have to be a professional. Um, and we just encourage you to talk to each other and to professionals and to friends um, asking questions. What should I do with these old gowns that I had, meaning you know, maybe a gown um, that you wore to dances in the 60s? You may laugh, but those may have another life. Um, and we actually donate tons, not really tons, but a lot of clothing to the Albuquerque Community Theaters. You all know you've got, what, eight maybe? I can't remember, eight or 10 uh, local community theaters and they all share a wardrobe facility. And so they'll take um, furs, which are almost impossible to sell in New Mexico because everybody's so protective of animals as well as I am also. Um, and they'll take those, um, they'll take old ball gowns, uh, men's clothing. Um, it's just a great way to give your items a second help. If some of you are downsizing from, let's say your 2,500 square foot home into a senior facility that might be a one bedroom, let's say maybe 800 square feet, um, of course you know it only stands to reason that you need to get a reliable floor plan from your new home and either ask a, a friend or a professional to help you determine how your selected furniture will fit in the new space. Um, going from 2,400 square feet to 800 is a pretty huge deduction. Uh, it's, it's de you know, reducing your items by two thirds. And so a lot of that's just gonna happen very quickly. Um, and some things you're gonna drop a tear or two about if it's a cabinet or a rug that you've just always loved. But a floor plan's gonna save you a lot of heartache later. These are the suggestions we have about what dis when you're deciding what to keep. First of all, make it very simple for yourself. Uh, most of us don't have the same energy and stamina that we used to. Um, so sometimes I suggest to someone, don't try to downsize your entire library on a weekend. Don't do that. Take one shelf, uh, two mornings a week, and pull out everything that you're willing to let go of. And it's amazing what we can accomplish just a little bite at a time rather than the whole job at once. So think about it that way. Now, before I get to this list, I wanna tell you in general uh, some ways that people who do downsizing professionally often suggest, and this is just good for all of us to know. Um, you can either begin what in, in the center of your home, and by that, that might be your living room, or it might be your study. Um, and I don't mean that quite literally the center of your home, but where your heart center is in your home. Because most likely, that's where your most beloved objects are going to be. And then as you get further and further out from the center of your home, you're not going to care as much about those things like gardening tools and what's in the cellar and what's in the, on the patio. So some people want to dive in and do the more uh, intimate and emotional items first and kind of make those hard decisions first. Other people want to kind of get a running start and start at the edges and go, oh yeah, I don't need three rakes. I just need one, you know, when I'm going to move. Um, so it's much easier to work from the outside in rather than the inside out. I personally really like to get a, a running start. So working in the garage is like, oh, boom, 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 boom. And then that night, I can see a lot of progress rather than I'm already, I know I have this one closet in my house that I just don't want to go there because it's going to be like every piece of paper I'm going to want to look at and it's going to take me a lot longer to do that. Anyway, those are um, ideas in general. So you might want to take one room at a time. Uh, if you're moving, 
Measure the big stuff, of course. All of this is common sense, but sometimes we get lost in the process. Touch every item. We find, in fact, this just happened two weeks ago. Uh, my team had been in this home. We were moving a couple from here to California, and we were tasked with packing uh, donations and consignment and getting those out of the house. Then they hired Allied Van Lines to come in and pack everything that was left to move to California. And that was actually at my suggestion. We do that kind of cross-working a lot with different moving companies. And then when one of my employees on the very last day after the deep cleaners had been there was tasked with going through every cabinet, every closet, and really making sure everything was gone, she found two pieces of pottery in the kitchen that were way back where obviously no one had seen them. They were in the dark. Um, so you really want to work at touching every item in a drawer, in a closet, and that's where a teenager might be really helpful to climb up on a stepladder for you to really look at those shelves in your closet, to look at the top shelves in the pantry, um, but touch every item and make a choice. And allow yourself time to reminisce. Now you might not want to sit there and reminisce on every item you pick up, but if there are a dozen objects out of your closet that you want to remember the images, the feelings, the stories, set them aside and do that in the next week or month, but you've already downsized the items that you can get out of your house. We strongly suggest focusing on yes and no piles, like yes, I'm keeping this, no, I'm not. And then uh, anything that you have a question about, do not get hung up on that. Just leave your questions to the back of the closet or the drawer or whatever and come back to them later. In other words, the idea is get through kind of uh, the bull rushes first. Those of you who grew up in churches know the word bull rushes and Moses. Uh, but anyway, the yes and no piles really are a very effective way to move through things. And then start early. Don't wait until the last minute um, to downsize your home. Uh, sort and purge. This was literally an office garage studio of a published author um, that we worked in. And many of us have places that look just like this. Um, you'll, if you're going to be doing some of your own packing, You'll want to make it as neat and tidy as possible. What we realize working with people who are grieving, if you're an 80-year-old person and your husband of 60 years has just died and in essence forced you now to downsize because you no longer need a 3,000 square foot house, what we find is that as we're packing for people, it's not only as you see on the right, how to really keep the, those pieces of art safe in, for storage or shipping. But in the middle, as we packed boxes of books for this particular gentleman, we make sure our staging areas are very neat and tidy and more symmetrical because what we find is that the more symmetrical and organized a space is, uh, it's anxiety relieving for a person who is grieving. And that's all subconscious. Um, they won't come up to me later and say, oh wow, it really re relieved my sadness to see all those boxes stacked like that. But it just makes sense that it's a relieving environment for someone who's grieving. Again, back to the essential inventory. Uh, this will help you immensely if you're moving even just across town uh, from a home you've lived in for 40 years into a one-bedroom apartment it will help you so much to be able to strategically choose how to unpack on the other end um, aging in place is something that many of us are choosing to do uh, the top picture was uh, a woman's apartment that we handled years ago in the albuquerque in Albuquerque, actually, and she had not died. She was actually in rehab when we were hired to go in and 
make sense of her living space. So the top picture is what it looked like the first day I walked in. The bottom picture is how it looked after our team uh, reorganized the space. And we were able to get permission to also uh, get rid of all the rugs that were on her floor. This is a safety issue for all of us if we're choosing to age in place and uh, put down new carpet, as you see there. And then this is a lift chair, um, the one that's, uh, that you see in that bottom picture, because she was gonna have some trouble with mobility when she came back. Uh, but we were able to really make some good sense of her space. And again, most of us just have too much stuff. I love this picture, because it's so New Mexican, isn't it? Um, so I'll leave that up. Let me ask you, do any of you have any specific questions or suggestions that you can share with all of us? Yeah, in the back. Um, vinyl records. Vinyl records, okay. The question is, and I'm gonna repeat it for those who are sitting in Virginia, um, vinyl records actually have a life. Um, Oddly enough, in Santa Fe, and that doesn't mean uh, he only works in Santa Fe, but he goes all over the state, there's a gentleman who is one of our country's premier vinyl experts. It's been his business in Michigan for 40 years. And he will um, come to your home, look at your vinyl, and if there are either recordings in good shape or if the cover is still in good shape and can be sold as art, he will make you an offer for your vinyl. Um, we, and you could uh, contact me. I think most of you have those notepads and so you can send me an email or a text to my cell number and ask for his name and phone number. He'll come to your home for no cost because he just, now that he sold his business, it's more of a hobby, but he's still in the business of buying. And um, so he'd love to come look at your vinyl collection. Now we also find that there are nonprofits in both Albuquerque and Santa Fe, for instance, like uh, the uh, resale store that might be connected to an animal shelter. A lot of those places will take vinyl old eight tracks, you remember those? It seems like a lifetime ago, and it was. And cassettes, and of course DVDs, um, and CDs. And they'll take them, because a lot of their clientele who comes to that nonprofit to buy still has turntables and recording uh, or record uh, equipment where they can still enjoy those elements. But you would be donating it. Does that help a little? Okay, okay sure. Uh huh. Yeah, just in terms of the records, um, the outpost performance space here in Albuquerque, which is a place that has uh, jazz, they have um, they had a not an auction but a, a fundraising drive, and many of their members donated records and books about music to support the outpost. Oh, wonderful. So let me repeat that. That's called the Outpost Performance space. space. And so it might be worth a call to see if they're still collecting vinyl for the future. Uh -huh. and, and my other question was, I also have a, a lot, lot, lot of books. And they're very, you know, it's kind of my collection is my, is spiritually oriented or art history oriented. And is, do people, Yes. Well, actually, some of the libraries will accept your complete library. Um, we've had success in the past, since you, I assume, live in Albuquerque. Um, the public library is here, but it is essential that you call first and ask if they're receiving books and when. Um, but also the community colleges all have libraries, very much will want your books. Um, and then UNM uh, here in Albuquerque, we end up, uh, in fact, right now, tomorrow, we're starting a job near Española where a woman was professor of German literature. And so we're donating her entire 
uh, library of uh, German literature to UNM. Now, uh, it just so happens the community college in Santa Fe, and I don't know uh, for sure if the community colleges in Albuquerque do this, but when we donate books to the community college in Santa Fe, they first call them for anything they need on their shelves to fill in the holes. But then everything that's left over, they donate to an online uh, organization that distributes English books internationally. And these are shipped to Africa, Asia, wherever, because people learn English as a second language from these books. So at least when we're donating to the community college in Santa Fe, we know that they're getting the chance at two more life cycles, both at the community college and then on the internet. I could also, if you would text or email me, I'd be happy to share that resource with you about the internet online place where you can donate. We have an online question. Okay. Uh, what about prints? Who do you contact to find value for those? Okay, the prints. Um, actually, I'm assuming by print they mean anything from a lithograph to like collectible posters. Yeah. Um, so the first place to check out, honestly, is places online, either different auction houses or Etsy. I always say that wrong, I think. I get the TNS mixed up. Sorry, guys. Uh, you know, it's my dyslexia coming forth, which I don't have. Um, anyway, uh, check them online, and then where whatever community you live in, almost any community in our country is going to have a retail store dedicated to posters. Now, you say, but these are prints, they're not posters, but a good poster retailer will be your first resource about the uh, value and then the resale location for any prints that you may have. Um, and then if you happen to live in an area like Albuquerque and Santa Fe, which are gallery rich locations, um, those galleries sometimes can be a good uh, resource for a referral on values and sales. But all, there are so many uh, online sales venues um, that that's a very good place to get some basic current market values for your prints. Yes? What about medical books? What about what? Medical books. Medical books. Medical books. Oh, wow. Well, that's the first time I've ever been asked that question. Um, so, you know, again, we often will contact for these unique kinds of collections. We often call a university first. Um, in fact, I'm thinking years ago, we handled a man who had been a research scientist at Los Alamos. He was retired, but his third bedroom was set up just like a laboratory. And we ended up donating uh, all kinds of equipment to UNM, which they really couldn't use in their classrooms because it was so dated, but they used, you know how uh, universities will have in their hallways display cases of like medical equipment from the 1910s or the 1890s. They used a lot of it that way. So I would just contact UNM first or whatever community you live in. Uh, to see if they can utilize that. And other than that, I, I'm drawing a blank beyond the local university. Mm -hmm. I, had a, I had a watch that I thought might have some value. I took it to a watch show with a bunch of dealers and brought it on to several of them. And I had offers of, uh, from $150, $100, $175. I looked on eBay and saw the same watch for multi-thousand dollars uh, wow. and wound up selling it for twenty-four hundred dollars. Wow. This wow. is something that was offered to they they were offering a hundred bucks for it. Right, right. So I would say if you have a thing, a, 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 a thing that looks like it might be unusual or go on eBay and see if you can find one there. Yes. I'm just gonna repeat some of what you said uh, for those at home. 
Uh, this gentleman in our audience uh, had a watch that he had been offered locally under $200 for it repeatedly. But when he went online, you got $2,400? $2,400 for it. Now, that is very good, uh, a very good suggestion. eBay's great. Again, there are multiple uh, retail sites online. In general, what I want to say is, and, and this really comes to clothing and books, uh, eBay has become a marketplace for the buyer preferenced over the seller. And I know this from people who've been professionals in online sales. So just be really careful about what you're selling uh, online. Um, but anyway, sometimes these things happen that you can get a lot more online. Also, you can be really led astray if the item hasn't actually sold online for a hyperinflated amount, always look for what it's sold for, not what it was presented for, because that can kind of build expectations. But thank you. Uh huh. I met a woman who is she's kind of a semi-antique dealer, and she specializes in vintage clothing, and she had um, a collection of dresses that were from I don't know the 1920s. And a designer in New York bought them from her so that they could not copy, but, but they wanted to see those designs so that they could create some of their own in, yes. in that image. Yes. So you never know what this stuff is going to be worth. That's right. And so, again, this example was this woman had a collection of antique vintage clothing that she was able to, to sell to a designer in New York that they were gonna use in their own specific ways. That is phenomenal when that happens. Uh, and all it takes is some time and ingenuity and a little grit on your part to do the online research to find those places, but you're exactly right. There's almost always a place for everything if you have the time. Okay, any more questions? Online questions? We're good? Thank you all, and thank you, Virtual World, for joining us. Thank you so much, Karen. That was awesome, very great. And uh, please continue to uh, join us online. We have our, our next session will be coming up in 30 minutes with uh, Lisa Cosper from Morris Hall talking about estate planning issues. We're going to take a short lunch break here in Albuquerque and maybe where you are too. So we'll see you back online here in 30 minutes. <laughs>